Our gospel reading this morning is taken from John's account of the resurrection in chapter 20 of his gospel. Out of reverence for this good news about Jesus, I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. I invite you all to be seated. Years ago, I heard a story that maybe you've heard too about two friends who loved baseball. They had actually been uh, professional baseball players at one point. That's where they met. And even after they were no longer playing professionally, they still kept in touch. They were great friends. They coached together for a while. And they would watch the games together. And as they reached the end of their lives, being devout believers, believing in heaven, they had this question, will there be baseball in heaven? And they decided, they made, made a deal that if it was at all possible, Whichever one died first, after he had died, would somehow communicate to the other one whether there was baseball in heaven. So it eventually happened. One of them, Joe was his name, he, he died. And, and about a week after his funeral, his friend Tom had a dream. And in his dream, Tom, Joe appeared to him. He said, Joe, is that you? He said, yes, it's me. He said, and are you in heaven? He said, yes, I'm in heaven. He said, and i got to ask, is there baseball? And he said, yes, there's baseball. It's fantastic. Every day the weather is perfect. And there are some great players here. We play every day and our bodies are renewed. The games are fantastic. We just have a great time. And he said, that's, that's great. That's, that's good news. And, and then his friend Joe said, but there is one bit of bad news. He said, what could possibly be bad news? He said, well, I looked on the roster for next week and you're signed up to pitch. <laughs> Most of us are curious about the afterlife, and we ought to be. We ought to be, because it's widely believed that there is an afterlife. Today, I want to talk about this big question, which is, is death the end? And I want to talk about it partly because it's something that, even though it's such a big question, I think we're increasingly in denial about the question in our culture. And I say that because, unlike, say, in my grandparents' time, uh, or great-grandparents, not a lot of people die at home. 
And in fact, most people die in ICU or they die in nursing facilities. And I've noticed more and more families don't even have a funeral or a memorial service. Uh, so it's kind of like dodging the question. And, and this is part of our culture increasingly. In, in fact, a, a number of years ago, I was uh, on my pastoral internship here down in Southern California in Orange County. And uh, someone told me about the community of Irvine that had won awards for master planning. Do you know what they did not plan into the community of Irvine? A cemetery. There's no cemetery. Apparently you can live there, but you can't die there. <laughs> Even churches used to have cemeteries surrounding them so that you would walk past the graves of people that you knew on your way into church. But that's no longer the case. So today I want to talk about what scripture says. Is that the end? Scripture resoundingly says, no, it is not the end. You don't just live on as a good memory in the minds of your friends for a generation, and that's it. And your body doesn't just become fertilizer for the next generation. The belief of Christianity, what Christ taught, what all of his followers witnessed and attested to, was bodily resurrection. That is that God raises us from the dead in perfected physical bodies. And that is the good news that we celebrate today. That is the great surprise that Easter is about. And I want to talk about a couple of implications of that for us. So is death the end? First of all, no, but grieving will someday end. That's what scripture tells us, grieving. You know, John, in his account of the resurrection, uh, he leaves a number of things out. He doesn't tell you who the other women were or even that there were other women that came there with Mary. But the other gospel writers say, well, Mary wasn't alone. There were other women. He doesn't even tell you why Mary had gone to the tomb in the reading that we just had. But you know what he mentions four times? That Mary was crying. Which I think is kind of unfair. Unless he's making a point. Unless he's making a point. Especially when Jesus, in the final time, asks him, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? You know, the two questions are related, aren't they? Because if you're looking for just a good teacher or a revolutionary leader or someone who was a victim of injustice or a good man, well, they die. And, and that's it. But if you're looking for the Son of God, the predicted Savior, the Messiah that the prophet said was coming, he's the one who broke death's hold for us. He's the one who rose from the dead. And sometimes in our grief, it's hard to remember that, that, that our lives are substantially different because we believe that Jesus was the Son of God and he rose from death. And one implication of that is that someday grieving will be over. Scripture is very, very clear about that. Because you see, in Scripture, our grief is attributed not to a, a capricious God who doesn't care. Our grief is attributed to sin, to our brokenness, the brokenness of other people, the brokenness of this world. And that was what Jesus came to provide a cure for. If you are sick this morning or, or hurt or grieving the loss of a loved one, Scripture says that's ultimately the result of sin. Or if you've been cheated or cheated on, that's sin. If you've lost your job or your home or your purpose or joy in living, that's the result of sin. If you're lonely or afraid or guilty or ashamed, <clears throat> those things come from sin. Sin being something God didn't introduce into the world. It's actually a corruption of a brokenness in our world. But here's the good news. I don't know if you caught it in the, the responsive reading that we did from Psalm 16, but God did not let his Holy One see decay. That's significant. Jesus didn't come out of the tomb as some zombie. He came out of the tomb hale and hearty and healthy. Amazingly so. And you and I will too, someday. That's the promise of Scripture. Because sin, decay, corruption, anything that is not of God will have been erased. In fact, that's how, you know, how, the, how the Bible ends. If you've ever gotten to the, the last couple of chapters, it says God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, 
No more mourning. No more crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. It's interesting. It says those things won't be there because something has happened in the past. The old order of things. The brokenness without hope for them ever being fixed has passed away. When I was uh, little, my favorite toy was Hot Wheels cars and Matchbox cars. I, I loved them. I would have races through the yard, and indoor, outdoor, and so on. You know, the funny thing was, by the time I was in my late teens, I don't know what happened to my Hot Wheels cars. I mean, maybe I put them in a box that was given to a younger child or, or something like that. And I never even really thought about it until I had my own kids. Where, where did they go? They disappeared. You know why I never thought about it? Because by the time I was in my late teens, I had a real car. I had a real car that was so much better that you could actually drive and, and go places and take friends and work on. And it was fantastic. And the Hot Wheels and Matchbox cars, they only hinted at that reality. And that's how it is for us, too, isn't it? You know, we like to hold on to the things of this life, and we think that they're so cool, they're so great, and they are. But Scripture tells us they only really hint at the reality that God has prepared for us. That this is just a glimpse of what God has prepared for us and desires for us. So here's another implication of the resurrection. Is death the end? No. So life is more than holding on. Because sometimes we feel like we're just holding on. And, and I was reminded of that when I read again this passage where Jesus says to Mary, Mary, do not hold on to me. Go instead to my brothers and tell them. I mean, it's natural that Mary would hold on, right? If you had a loved one who you thought had died a horrible death and then suddenly they're fine, I would want to hold on to them too. But Jesus had something for Mary to do. He says, you know, I haven't yet returned to my father. I'm going to be here for a while. It, it has, I'm not just going back up today. But um, I haven't yet returned to my father. And he had something for Mary to do that was important and unusual. Unusual because in Jesus' day, women were not considered reliable witnesses. In the Jewish law, you had to have two witnesses, witnesses and they had to be male. Uh, and in the culture of his day, women were not respected except by Jesus. Jesus chose Mary to be the first witness to his resurrection. And I think that that is significant. It was for Mary. We know her name. It was for his disciples and everyone who followed. And the message is that God hasn't just called us to hold on, to hunker in a bunker until Jesus comes back. He has us here to do more than that. He has purpose for our lives. When my own children were little, I had a baby backpack for them, and I would take them out backpacking. Uh, and, you know, they would be awake for maybe 20 minutes or a half an hour because that rhythmic walking, you know, they would kind of, which meant they wouldn't sleep as long at night. But it was still worth it. And the reason that I took them out backpacking, the lesson in that was not, I'm going to carry you for the rest of your life. They're 20 and 25 now. They can carry me. I probably can't carry them. No, the lesson was, this is a beautiful world that God has given us. And you should enjoy it. And he's given you a body to, to get exercise and to enjoy these good things. That was the message. And, and so now they're both avid hikers and they, they serve as outdoor guides during the, during the summer. And I point that out because it's certainly true that God will carry us. When we're new in the faith, when we're weak, when we can't carry ourselves. But that's not the rest of the story. He also desires that we grow, that we become more capable, that we become stronger spiritually, so that we can accomplish the things and enjoy the things that he has prepared for us. So this time of the resurrection, this is not the end of the story of Jesus, and it's certainly not the end of the story of the disciples either. If you read on the, the letters and the history that follows, you discover they had a very exciting life after this. And it's not the end of our story either. The resurrection of Jesus, what's behind me, this is the beginning of the adventure. So is death the end? No. And here's a third implication. Get ready to meet your God. Get ready to meet your God. 
That was the message that Mary was supposed to bring to Jesus' followers, wasn't it? It was, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And I want to point out this had to be a very reassuring message for them. Because when was the last time they had seen Jesus? Well, some of them, it was in the garden when they abandoned him as he was arrested. And others, we know there were a few that were witnesses to his crucifixion. And they had to be wondering. They had to be suffering from great guilt and wondering, how will God see me now? Am I eternally guilty before God because I abandoned his son? Is this the end of the story? Is there still a place for me? Before Jesus was crucified, he told them, I'm going to prepare a place for you. They didn't know where he was going. But now they had to wonder, is there a place for me with God, given that I've committed this heinous thing? And Jesus gives Mary this message. I'm going to my God and your God, my Father and your Father. Of course there's a place for you. Of course, that's why I came, as I told you. So that these sins could be wiped away, so that you could have security in your place with God that's not based on how good you are. I know you're all knuckleheads. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about the disciples. <laughs> no, that security comes from what Jesus has done for us, not for what we've done for him. And this is the best of news. When I say prepare to meet your God, I know it sounds like a line out of a Western movie, but it's not threatening for those who are followers of Jesus. It's something we look forward to because Jesus is the one who literally was dying for us to be with him. And God our Father is the one who knows how many hairs are on our heads. Anybody here know how many hairs are on your heads today? God does. That's what Jesus said. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what you need. He knows the opportunities that you will have. He desires to be your God. And nothing can separate us, Paul later says, from the love that is ours in Christ Jesus, except us. Except us. Unless we would rather we worship ourselves or rather worship some lesser God, because God can't force us to love him and never would. He woos us. He desires that we love him. But we still have freedom of choice. C.S. Lewis wrote a, wrote a book that, um, it's not one of his better known works, but I really like it. It's a work of fiction, and it's called The Great Divorce. And it's, uh, the premise is that people in hell can take a, a bus up to heaven and see heaven. And there's some surprising things in it, very creative. One of them is that in this book, hell is actually kind of a crack in the sidewalk of heaven. It's very, very small. Whereas heaven, they have to grow larger and larger and larger to experience heaven. And hell is very unsubstantial. I mean, people are there, but, you know, the houses they live in, the rain goes straight through them. They're not really real. They're just vapors. So as they climb up and grow up and are able to experience heaven, they have to become more real. In fact, they get to heaven, and it's so real that they can't walk on the grass because the grass is more real than their feet, and it just punctures their feet, so they have to kind of walk on the water in heaven. And to stay there, they would have to grow stronger and more substantial to live in heaven. But here's the other surprising thing. None of the people on the bus do. They all eventually turn around and go back. They all eventually choose... Whatever it was that they substituted for God. For some of them it's their own ego. For some of them it's a particular uh, material thing. For some of them it's the demon on their shoulder that they would rather serve than serve the true God. All of us, someday, will be accountable for who we worship. And God would not, cannot have us in heaven worshiping anyone other than him because he is the true God. And that's not a burden for those of us who are believers in Jesus. That's a great joy. It's a great joy that everything depends on him. That he who knows us better than anyone and loves us more than anyone possibly could is the one who has prepared a perfect place for us. So is that the end? No. No. So get ready to meet your God and know so we have good news to share. The good news about the true nature of that God about what Jesus was really doing when he was crucified. It wasn't an accident, it was a sacrifice. 
It, it wasn't something that was just human evil overtaking a good man. It was human evil being conquered by the willing sacrifice of God's son for everyone, for everyone. You know, there's a, another story I heard years ago about two guys that are in hell and all of a sudden it starts snowing. And one of them looks up and says, wow, wouldn't you know? I can't believe it. The Cubs have won the World Series. <laughs> yeah, I looked in Illinois like growing up. So. <laughs> that kind of stuff. But do you know, that's a joke, but do you know that what the one big surprise that Scripture reveals in hell is? There was an event that surprised hell. And it's when we talk about, or at least mention in Christianity, it's when Jesus descended into hell. He did not descend according to scripture, in order to suffer the torments of hell. He had already done that. He had already been separated from his father on the cross. He descends into hell to declare victory. Victory over sin and death and the devil and his claim on us. That's why Jesus descended into hell. Because he had already won the victory. And that is what this day is about. It's about the victory on our behalf that Jesus conquered death that he conquered our guilt and our shame, that he conquered everything that could separate us from God. That's what this day is about. So we no longer fear God, no matter how we think that we've failed him. We no longer fear death, no matter when or how it comes. And we no longer fear the accusations of the devil or our conscience. So Paul writes, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sin of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.